So I want to thank GIZ for the opportunity of having us here. And I want to build on a few of the ideas that Dorothy presented um, and try shedding a little bit of light of how we look at technology and why we're doing what we're doing. And I want to talk about certainties. And the first certainty about technology is that we're blind to it. There's this wonderful definition uh, called technological somnambulism, which says it's the way we view technologies as, something, as tools, as things we can put down and pick, pick them up again, is flawed. Uh, because of this view that technologies are just objects and something we can separate ourselves from, we don't see the, their long-term implications. So the moment we incorporate a technology, any technology, into our life, we are forever changed because it changes our expectations and the way that we expect the world uh, to work. So my name is Michel. I'm a geek and a nerd. And uh, I was born in 82, so I'm sort of first-generation millennial, born in Stockholm, got broadband very early, so I was in many ways, sort of pushed into the online world, whether I wanted to or not. And some of my friends define me as, oh, here she is. Some of my friends define me as uh, the, the intersection between an early adopter and a heavy user. And I, I guess, yeah, it can be a little bit distracting, but this is my dog. And um, <laughs> just a little bit. Yes, that's enough. And um, so I do spend a lot of my time not only using technology, but also thinking about it. And the work we're doing at Envisioning is meant to help people understand the implications and develop their own long-term view of where technology is heading and what it's doing to us. Um, one of my formal titles is that of a futurist, but I like putting the asterisks around it because it's not so much about the crystal ball knowing what's next, but rather how can we, how can we draw uh, road, uh, maps or roadways into the future and decide which future we actually want to opt for and how can we do that collectively. So the first thing we need to do is to define or at least establish a common baseline of what technology is because technology uh, follows many definitions. One good, one, one good definition is technology was invent is everything invented after we're born. Uh, so everything that, that exists when we're born into the world is just there in an obvious way of how the world works, but everything that's new, we're like, oh, what is this? Are we sure we want this? And I think this is a good way of, of framing it because we don't look at electric light um, as, as a technology, but it's, you know, we need it to be where we are. And every technology follows a certain direction. They all develop, they all build up over time, individually and collectively. So you can sort of draw the visible history of writing and see how we got to where we are now. And this works for every given technology. Um, something as trivial or as obvious as aviation uh, was, you know, wasn't possible a century ago. Some, and when we look at what's happening now, such as the, uh, the parkour robot on the left, um, on my left, your right, and compared to where robotics was only a decade ago. These are actual videos, 10 years apart, and it's a good, quick way of reminding us of how quickly these things are moving and how much is actually, uh, is how much is changing in such little time. We used to hunt, now we click when we're hungry. And this is, this too, this sheds some light on how it affects our expectations, because once you know that the delivery server service exists, it's going to affect your decision-making process. It's going to make you think differently the next time you're hungry. Moore's law effectively says that, that things get faster, faster, and things get cheaper, faster. And these are certainties in the uncertainty of where technology is taking us. And if this is true, then we have to sort of agree on that everything is accelerating because technology has, ends up affecting all of these different aspects of our lives. And if everything is accelerating, that also means that today is the slowest day we'll ever live through. Tomorrow will be slightly faster, and the next day will be slightly faster, and so on and so forth. The good thing is this is true for everyone. It affects all of us. And I think the way out of it is to, is to, sh is to see what's, come, you know, what's moving in our direction and understanding some of these patterns, some of these uncertainties that exist in the uncertainty of technological development. So we, we're certain of exponential change, but which is the sort of the framing of this, uh, of this trend, if you will. But if you have exponential change, you also inevitably have consequences. And these consequences are far more interesting and far more uncertain than that of the exponential change. So for example, the automobile, uh, which we've all taken for granted, was more than just a faster horse and ended up affecting us in many different ways. The, the fact that we have urbanization and urban sprawl is a direct consequence of the, of the popularization of the automobile. Same thing with allocating so much space on our planet to just storing cars. And traffic did not really exist before the car. So all of these things are just part of how the world works now, 
but they're a direct consequence of a single technology, a very popular one and a ubiquitous one and one that has established large economies, but it's still just a technology. The same way elevators have led to cities like Hong Kong. You don't have vertical, you don't have dense uh, cities with, with, uh, with vertical locomotion unless, sorry, you don't have dense cities unless you have vertical locomotion. Nobody wants to live on the 44th floor unless you have an elevator. But once you invent the elevator, cities like these become possible. It's non-obvious, but there's still a direct correlation. Once you have social media, you can affect the out outcome of elections, apparently. And now and we have to take it for granted because you can't extinguish social media. That's not an option anymore. So how do you deal with it? And of course, I'm thankful to be European in these moments where at least here we're asking those questions as opposed to many other places. Roy Amara, uh, the founder of the Institute for the Future, uh, has a law in his name which basically says that we tend to overestimate the short term effects of technology and we tend to underestimate their long-term effects. So in the short term, we think technologies will be way more impactful and disruptive than they actually are. Then we forget about them. We go back to norm normality. And after a while, they take off and actually end up changing our lives way more than we expected it, it to be possible. The tricky thing is this is true even when you know it's true. So you have to keep compensating and sort of climbing up the hill more and more, faster and faster. So these are two certainties. I'm going to talk about a third certainty that maps on directly to the work we're doing here, and that is the strong correlation between science fiction and science fact. So again, as a geek, uh, I did spend, and I still do spend a lot of time consuming science fiction, and after a while you notice that there's, there's too much correlation between what's happening in, in sci-fi to reality to be a coincidence. And so that's, that's one of the ways that we look at technology at Envisioning, is to look at the full timeline between idea and reality. We we believe that every technology begins as an idea. Some of these ideas become concepts. Some concepts eventually merge into prototypes, and some prototypes eventually make their way into becoming products. It doesn't mean that every idea becomes a product, but it means that every product began as an idea. And we can map this, and we can track this. And, and the sci-fi aspect is fundamental, because the things that we dream up end up becoming a reality, not the way we see them, but you could argue that the Dyson autonomous robot is a variation of the Rosie from the Jetsons. The same way you could, um, sometimes it's directly assumed, such as the tricorder uh, in Star Trek, where you measure someone's vital signs, became a product. It, it was an, there was an X prize around it a few years ago, and you know, dozens of companies put millions of dollars together in order to build the technology from the film or, or from the TV series. So these things manifest. Nike, you know, famously, uh, created a self-lacing shoe, which is not a product. It was a film a few years ago, and now it's an actual thing you can buy. My favorite example is Arthur C. Clarke, one of the writers of 2001, who, as a scientist, published a paper in 45 saying, hey, if you want to send signals around the world, you should put these flying objects uh, in this particular orbit, uh, which is called the Clark orbit. And 19 years later, the Tokyo Olympics were broadcast using the first communication satellite uh, in real time around the world. So in 19 years, you had the jump between idea into reality. And these examples keep happening over and over again. It's not a coincidence. The Star Tack from Star Trek is the last Star Trek example, I promise. <laughs> and, um, and I want to argue that imagination instructs innovation. Innovation begins as imagination. Imagination is broader. It's wider. Everything is possible in imagination. Everything is not possible in innovation, but one begets the other. And the fourth certainty is the work we're trying to do together with GIZ and a couple of other partners. And it's our, our attempt at building a platform for tracking knowledge around these technologies. Because if technologies are so impactful, if they are so disruptive, if they have all of these effects on us, then how do we keep track? Well, it turns out nobody really is, or at least nobody's doing that collectively. A lot of organizations do it individually, we want to do it collectively. So we track technologies throughout their whole lifespan. We track science fiction, we take films, we observe the technologies that appear in them, and books and video games, and translate them into database entries. Not only sci-fi, obviously, but uh, like everywhere we see technologies, we track them, we organize them, we catalog them. We, track, we do this cross-sector 360 in every, in every conceivable direction. We look at technology, we try incorporating them, measuring them, assessing them. And we're doing this because we believe people need to make, everyone, has the right to making better choices about what's out there. A lot of hype is invested into AI, ML, blockchain, obviously, but there's so much more out there. And they're all at different levels, and these levels vary per region. And we're trying to add a data layer to that because it's 
remarkably hasn't been done. So we're building an intelligence platform in conjunction with, again, the GIZ and a, ha a handful of other uh, partners around the world with the intent of bringing this knowledge to as many people as possible. We're, we're creating this in the open, we're, cre we're, we're turning this into a public utility which anyone can access and everyone should access to learn about what's going on. We do a lot of visualization work, I'm not going to go into it because you're going to see more of it in a, in a few minutes, but we believe that the best way to represent the data is visually. We believe uh, interactive visualizations are way more engaging than reports and actually convey information more efficiently. Our belief is also that, in, in, uh, as Dorothy was talking about, in so many other ways, with so much more eloquence than I can, it's about being inclusive. It's about making, bringing the capability of making better choices to more people. We're, do, we're building this as a, as a public utility, obviously, because it's 2020, come on. Uh, and we're doing it globally. These are the locations of the organizations that are on board now helping us do this. Um, and we work both in the public and private sector. And uh, we have the privilege of working with wonderful organizations that believe in this vision and that actually want to help us build this together. And to s wrap things up, technology is neither n good nor bad, but it's also not neutral. So every technology comes with bias. Every technology can be used for any possible uh, outcome, but they all have some you know, potential built into them. And understanding that is fundamental. Understanding the implications of that is crucial to the type of decision-making we have to make today. So thank you very much.